Evening, I'm sorry I'm 10 minutes late. I was in town for an appointment. Yes, I have had my hair cut. And uh, so everything is coming to a jamming halt in London at the moment because we're about to go into a train strike. So I'm late. I'm really sorry. So uh, I'm going to start by saying I'm going to go live with a real beauty insider and that is Lorna Radford. She is one of the UK's, if not the UK's, leading formulating chemist. And what she doesn't know about formulating skin and hair care is not worth knowing. So we're going to go live with her. It's her first live, I think, so she's a bit nervous. So be gentle with her. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's such a a rising stra star. Um, what would I call her? Existing star. She's a real beauty insider. And there you go. And there she is. There you go. Let's see if she's around. I let her know that I was going to be a little bit late, so uh, hopefully she'll be prepared for it as well. Now, the thing about Lorna is she is the formulating chemist by, behind so many British beauty companies, but she signs an NDA, so she can't technically tell us exactly what she's formulated, but she can intimate brands she's worked with and she's going to share some hints and tips on what we should be looking for in terms of ingredients whether we can read inky lists i suspect we can't because we're not as smart she's got a double first at cambridge so uh thank you very much if you like my hair like this i've literally just had it brazilian blow dried and it took a very long time and i've gone a little bit blonder and a lot shorter as well um i if you laura if you want a really good under eye concealer look no further than what i've just put on which is the maybelline one the under eye rays it's incredible and really reasonably priced and i need to find out if lorna also formulates makeup i think it's just skincare and hair care where are you lorna thank you very much it's 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 very flat at the moment but it will become a lot a lot fuller i promise i promise it will <clears throat> thank you oh you all like it i mean i personally think it's a bit flat at the moment because i've just had it brazilian blow dried uh wow cute hair where are you? Where are you, Lorna? I'm going to invite you again. I'm just going to type your name in and invite you again. Face screen recommendations. There she is. Oh, look at that. That is the coolest setup I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> That was an accidental wrong way round, and <laughs> yeah. I loved it instantly. Uh, uh, I have this very high tech lab around me and can't figure out how to use Instagram or my phone for the life of me. <laughs> Listen, I don't care if you never master Instagram, Lorna, as long as you keep making some of the best beauty products on the market. I was <laughs> politely saying at the top of the live that I genuinely think, and I know you're going to be really modest about this, you are a real high flyer. You're so well respected in the industry. You're the UK's leading formulating chemist. And I don't care what anybody says. You cannot deny that. But I was saying, and we had a quick chat when we met at uh, the launch of Self recently, the wonderful Angeli Martos clinic, that you sign NDAs because essentially brands don't necessarily credit the formulating chemist. So let's dive straight in and say... How do you end up becoming a formulating chemist and explain exactly what it does to people who don't know? Sure. So um, I actually, I fell into it a bit by chance, actually. So I, I studied uh, natural sciences at university, specialised in chemistry. Didn't really know that the world of cosmetics existed sort of from, a, from a scientific perspective. I think like a lot of graduates, got to the end of my degree, panicked about what to do with my life and... Um, actually uh, interviewed for a load of places, including a company called Aston Chemicals, who basically sell ingredients into the cosmetics industry. Um, so as soon as I met them, I was like, yep, that's, that's it. I found my people, found my place, found what I want to do. I joined them and effectively, um, you know, so many skincare and hair care brands have these amazing ideas of what they want to create, how they want to help people but they don't actually know how to develop that, what the science behind it is. Um, so that's where my company comes in, uh, NCOS. Basically, a brand can come to us and say, we really want to help people. We know what we want to achieve, but we don't know how to, how to make that. And then uh, my wonderful team here. Uh, so, we, yeah, we're, we're a big, big team of scientists now, not just me. So I definitely can't take all the credit, but we'll, uh, we'll go into the lab, brainstorm everything, um, 
this is where the magic happens. So mix, mix everything together. And um, yeah, it's a lot of back and forth and so much science involved every step of the way. Um, it's, I mean, in, it's incredible. It's very interesting. I did a live on this morning the other day and we were talking about vitamin C formulations and I happened to mention the ordinary pure ellascorbic acid powder. And I said, look, this is an option. But for me, I prefer to trust a formulating chemist, you know, and neither of the presenters had heard of a formulating chemist. And I sort of had to explain what you did. And I think it's because you're the unsung heroes of the industry. You're very rarely, and I know absolutely, you're not necessarily comfortable even doing this, but you're, ne you're very rarely brought out and nobody sort of, you know, a noses, for example, they're the big heroes, aren't they? Or oh, I don't know. They're amazing, that yeah that develops a, a drug would be a, a sort well maybe there'd be a hung, unsung hero or a dermatologist but nobody ever says and here's our formulating chemist then rolls you out so i was i was amazed that people didn't even know what they were i guess we're, we're kind of the equivalent to a chef in a way you know we, we start with a bunch of ingredients um and you know you'll hear a lot of the same ingredients around time and time and again um you know you mentioned vitamin c um retinol but actually there are so many different ways to combine those same ingredients, so many different ways to process them differently, that you end up with literally millions of different possibilities, some of which some people prefer. Like if you think of a spaghetti bolognese or something, you know, there's, uh, each person has their preference. And, and so we're, we're really the, the people putting that together in different ways uh, to, to, to work differently for different people, really. Okay, now I need to start by saying you've got a double first from Cambridge you worked at this other company and now you set up your own company but how old are you Lorna because you to me you seem so young I remember seeing you get on stage at the CEW awards and already then thinking she looks like she's barely graduated and you'd started NCOS then your own company so you are a high flyer how old are you I turned 32 this weekend but I I think I got very lucky in that so I've, I've always got a million and one things rushing around in my head um but i i spotted i guess i got lucky in spotting a gap in the market or what i thought was a gap in the market um quite young um, quite early into my career and the and that that gap was basically creating a very scientifically driven high performance based uh formulation lab to to help support brands and i kind of i mulled over it for about 12 18 months sort of putting together different ideas different business plans of what that could look like but the the more i thought about it um the more i realized it was it was just me it kind of called to me because i i love helping people and this was an opportunity to help brands um obviously i love science you know i've got got a science training science background um and the other thing is uh I love creating things so actually before I ever wanted to be a scientist I actually wanted to be an artist I just love sort of creating give me a blank page and I'll I'll be sort of in my happy zone and and you know formulating four different brands is basically taking taking an idea in its very bare bones and then actually fleshing it out and, and creating something from it it's very interesting because people say to me that when i trained as a journalist they said what drove what what, what made you eventually become a, a specialist within health and beauty and beauty in particular and i said because to me it's the the perfect mix of science and art i Absolutely. i love it right so let's quickly name drop some of the brands you can mention that you've worked with <laughs> I have to be ever so careful. Um, so yeah, we work um, mostly across skincare and hair care. Do a tiny bit of colour, but that's not really where our, our expertise lies. Um, so for skin, we work with brands like Ren. Uh, we've done some stuff with Primark. Uh, for hair, we've worked with Philip Kingsley, George Northwood, Curl Smith, who are very big out in the US um, for curly hair, as the name suggests. Um, and I'm going to stop there in case I get myself in trouble. <laughs> okay, so so I guess this, and maybe I'm putting words into your mouth, but do you sign an NDA because companies like to to own the formulation? So it's almost as if they say we created this or not. It, I guess with a company like Primark, you don't even get that mess messaging, do you? It's just here's a great new product. Yeah, I, th I think what is um, surprising is how unique each formulation is to each um, each company and so of course there's an element of wanting to to protect what what your idea is and, and what uh, what comes out of that um, coming back to the idea of this 
sort of spaghetti bolognese and each one at different restaurants being slightly different you don't really want someone else being able to copy your recipe no. so um you know we're we're very ethically morally driven at NCOS anyway so we we wouldn't do that everything we create is bespoke for each brand but i guess the nda just gives that element of um a bit of a safety net and reassurance to the brand that we're not going to sort of run off and, and give that same thing to someone else now before we dive into your favorite ingredients and you, you have got some products there i know and it was so funny because lorna said do you mind it if a lot of them are jk brands and i was like no they're they're all my favorite brands it'll be fine but before we dive into that and your favorite ingredients how do you feel about people who were non-scientists reading inky lists is it really misleading that's the ingredients list by the way because there's been this over the last sort of five or six years i guess since the ordinary there's been this focus on active ingredients and looking for active ingredients is it misleading to read an inky list i think no and yes um i, I think any education is great the more you can learn the better um, I think there's a lot that an inky list doesn't give away and I've got a few examples of that actually in, in some of the ingredients I'll talk about um, it's yeah you can you can tell at a surface level I mean where it's really important is if you have a known allergy to something you know if you're really allergic to nut oils you're probably going to use the inky list to avoid that but what it can't tell you is the quality of the ingredients or the sourcing of the ingredients you're using uh, you can't necessarily tell what levels they've been used at, how they've been processed, uh, where they've been sourced from. Um, so that's really where you have to rely on a brand being authentic and communicating that through through other means other than just the inky list as well. Yeah. Right. Let's dive into your ingredients. Where do you want to start? Oh, so I I know there are some ingredients that have been mentioned time and time and again, like vitamin C, retinol, peptides. I no problem I, chatting about them. <laughs> well, so, Today I thought I'd, I'd shine a light on some different ones, which okay. I think are, are equally interesting, very cool technology. Um, it's not that I don't like retinol and vitamin C, I just, just want to share the love a bit Go with some, some unsung heroes. <laughs> um, and uh, actually I'm, I'm going to be quite, quite boring with my first one, it's actually glycerin. Oh, love glycerin. I was going to say to you, can we just stop with the HA and start talking about glycerin? <laughs> I talk about glycerin and HA and a hyaluronic acid, and I say that if hyaluronic acid is Bella and Gigi Hadid, glycerin is Cindy Crawford and that generation of supermodels. I, my skin loves glycerin. Yeah, it's, it's cost effective, easy to include. Um, it's a humectant, meaning that it holds onto water. So it just helps retain water in the skin. And it's, you know, it's, as you already know, Dean, but it's basically in every moisturiser, every cream, every lotion, normally somewhere between second and fifth place on the inky list. Uh, I've got some here. I don't know if you've ever seen it in raw form. So this is our, uh, our bottle of glycerin. Is it and I'm just gonna... quite gloopy? It is. Yeah. So I'm going to do this without pouring it on my laptop, hopefully. <laughs> but I don't know if you can see it here. It's yeah. kind of like slightly thin yes. honey. So we we don't want to use too much of it because it, it can get a bit sticky and tacky um but yeah it's sort of three percent five percent in most formulations it's going to do a really good job of moisturizing the skin without feeling feeling too heavy can it be used on the hair as well or not it can the the difficulty with hair is more moisture is not necessarily always a good thing I, in hair can i just say i feel like there could be a part two here specifically about hair and hair myths because the things that are demonized in hair care drive me mad. And then the big thing about hyaluronic acid and locking moisture into hair. I feel like there could be a part two here coming up already. Yeah, I mean, just, just in short, it's kind of all about balance because if, you're, if your hair doesn't have enough water in it, it gets really dry and brittle and it can snap easily, break easily. But if you've actually got too much water in the center of the hair, it basically causes it to swell. And the nice scale like cuticles you've got on the outside of the hair lift up and then causes all sorts of damage so you really want to be in that midway balance um there are people that know far more about that than me in the sort of testing realms so i should probably pass the bat on to them but um okay yeah, ingredient different. number two yeah and if you've got all of them there i'm gonna be blown away <laughs> i've only got a few okay. but, but there are some more um the the next ingredient for me is madacacicide yeah uh 
this is loved by everyone in Korea, basically. Uh, but for me, it also represents a bit of a, a personal learning journey and revelation. So um, I'm, I'm half Korean. Uh, the Korean side of my family has really strong roots in traditional Korean herbal medicine. So kind of similar to Chinese medicine, um, where you use certain herbs, certain plants that you process and combine in particular ways to provide holistic health benefits, spans back sort of centuries. Um, and I think being being scientifically minded and always being quite a critical thinker and quite sceptical in general, um, I, I always sort of poo the idea with my family. I'm like, no, no, that's a load of nonsense. There's no data. Prove to me that it actually works. Prove it to me. Um, and the more I've been in this industry, the more I realise how much actually nature can provide. And we, it, we might not know how it's working. We might not know all the answers yet. But that's where there's so much exciting scientific innovation and technology happening right now. When you mentioned um, that you wanted to mention Korean skincare, and I said, absolutely. One of my favorite lives is, is with Dr. Christine Hall, is, who is Anglo-Korean. And she was explaining to me what Madagascar does. And then we were going on to Centella Asiatica. We were saying that these things have been used for centuries, but it's only now that skincare is going, actually, this stuff really works. So explain what it is and what it does for the skin. Sure. So, um, as you mentioned, Centella asiatica is the plant that it comes from. Uh, Centella asiatica is also known as tiger grass because traditionally at, so this plant grows naturally in Asia and Africa. And tigers would actually rub up against this tiger grass to, to help with wound healing. Um, and it's only more recently that scientists have discovered there are four main bioactive components uh, within Centella asiatica. So madacasicide, madacasic acid, Asiatic aside and Asiatic acid. And these four together do a huge number of uh, beneficial things on the skin. Uh, but the, I guess my personal favourite out of those is the Madagascar side because it's so good at soothing. Um, it's all about calming the skin down, anti-redness, just getting that, that skin back to, to base calm level. Um, it's, and, it's the foundation of uh, the Seeker ranges that come yeah. out, like the Dr. Jart ranges, isn't yeah. it? Essentially. Yeah. I think that's that's really the most famous yeah. one. But um, if if anyone ever goes out to Korea, like literally any shop you walk into, there will be a sicker range and just Centella Asiatica everywhere. Can, and can I just thank is... you if anybody would like to sponsor myself and Lorna going and Dr. Christine Hall, because I feel like it's a meeting of minds here to go to South Korea. I'm in. <laughs> I've never I'm been in. and I would <laughs> love, love, love to go. I really would. I would love to go. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's also quite interesting because it's been so popular for so long. Um, Korean consumers have got really savvy to like the quality of the Centella Asiatica extract as well. So it's quite common to see on the front of pack an almost pharmaceutical like claim where it will say Madagascar used at 10,000 ppm or used at an exact percentage so that um, you know that it's not just Centella Asiatica extract. It's actually specifically been processed to get this one bioactive component in its pure form that's really going to work on the skin. A little bit like good herbal supplements within the UK, I presume. Uh, quick question. So uh, is there a problem? Is it farmed? Is there a problem that we can sort of just take it all from nature? Because that's that's obviously the, the, the balancing act between pro, uh, active ingredients or plants that are taken from nature and ones that are bio harvested or, or created, yeah. fermented in labs. Because I know obviously Korean skincare obviously the king of fermenting as well, which is secret, so many ingredients. Do, do we worry about taking it from nature as well? Um, I, I think with any plant source, there's always that concern. Um, you know, there are a lot of us humans on the planet. And if we all get behind something, there is a risk of, of over farming or not being able to farm enough of it. Um, with the Madagascar side grade that we normally use here at NCOS, it's actually responsibly sourced from um, Centella asiatica grown on Madagascar, and so it's actually an African source. But the uh, the company behind it actually has an Ecovardis Platinum um, medal, which basically means that they are in the top one percent or something of of basically responsible sourcing for um, for various ESG targets, so sustainability wise. So no particular worries in in that case. But yeah, it's always best to be to be mindful. Okay next active ingredient so 
similarly to the whole Korean medicine, ancient Chinese medicine, um, the other big one is Ayurveda and Ayurvedic medicine. And um, one of the most celebrated plants in that is um, amla, the amla tree. Yeah. Um, and emblica is a, a trade name of an active ingredient that is derived from the amla fruit. Um, and the, the botanical name of amla is Philanthus emblica fruit. So that's where the name emblica comes from. Uh, but that is, so like Centella asiatica is rich in those four bioactive compounds. Emblica is rich in specific uh, tannins, so it's got um, specifically some low molecular weight hydrolyzable tannins called emblicanin A and emblicanin B. Um, but basically it works as a really great antioxidant on the skin. Uh, so it can help to quench potential skin damage from free radical damage. Um, things like pollution, blue light, UV can basically create free radicals on the skin, which are these really high energy um, particles. And that creates a whole set of negative reactions on the skin. Um, I call them sort of cascades where over time it leads to degradation of the skin and that can lead to premature sim symptoms of, of skin aging. It's very interesting as well. So many of my followers also can't use uh, L-ascorbic acid, which is obviously the current gold standard yeah. antioxidant. So any research into good antioxidants that are well tolerated on the skin at a sort of slightly acidic pH, not too acidic, is a good thing for me because so many people don't like using vitamin C. Yeah, and I think there are so many other great antioxidants out there. Um, and yeah, so this is one example. And I think what's also interesting is with vitamin C, um, you know, there seems to almost be a bit of a fight for higher and higher levels where actually um, the skin can only take in so much at any one time. There's a limit to the bioavailability. And if you uh, overstep that, you've basically just got excess vitamin C sitting on your skin, ready to cause irritation and, and issues. So um, I guess this is where the, the K-beauty side really shines through for me is little and often. So um, combine different antioxidants at lower levels in harmony with each other, use it through a stepped routine on a regular basis. And that's much more likely to, to, to offer you some great skin benefits while you know it might not be like an overnight transformation like you might get from a really high and um, high active level but it's that that sort of consistency that's going to help protect your skin it's, long term it's very interesting because i hadn't heard of amla being used in skincare you traditionally hear it being used in indian hair care don't you yeah. my friend joe yeah. who suffers from terribly dry damaged hair is obsessed with her amla oil that she buys at her local um uh, i think it might be a local supermarket i can't remember but anyway she loves it and every time we come on and she does a live everybody with an ayurvedic um indian southern indian heritage says oh we grew up with that yeah. but i've never heard it used in skincare which is fascinating and yeah so the um the amlet oil is uh, as the name suggests the oily part of the plant whereas this is actually a water soluble part so you're looking at different parts of the plant which is quite Ah. quite interesting and also quite quite good from a sustainability perspective as well because then you're looking at using more parts of the plant somebody just said amla oil doesn't smell very nice so does the amla you use in skincare have no scent at all i presume it depends on the level of refinement um so um we've got basically uh this is where the inky name doesn't always say everything uh you can get grades of almost any oil from cold press through to different levels of refinement and the more you refine it, generally the better it smells and the more stable it becomes. But then you lose some of the nice, nice compounds. So it, it's, it's very interesting. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why I said on live TV, I prefer to rely on a formulating chemist that knows what they're doing. Right. Next active ingredient. Uh, so I guess this is actually coming back to this whole idea of, of quality and sourcing of ingredients. Um, I think an example I always like to give is if I said I use green tea extract uh, you wouldn't know if I've simply just got one green tea leaf and boiled it in a vat of 20 tons of water or if I'm using some really novel technology like supercritical carbon dioxide extraction natural deep eutectic solvent technology something to really get those best compounds out of it um, but the other thing the the inky list won't tell you is the uh, environmental and social impact of the ingredient that you're sourcing and a really nice example of giving back to communities is uh, a grade of shea butter actually called Lipex Shea. And um, 
in terms of performance, it's shea butter. It's got um, a particular process on on it that makes it more uh, stable than a lot of other shea butters on the market. Uh, but what I really love about it is the the company behind it are called AAK, and they specifically source their shea directly from the women who wild harvest the shea fruit in West Africa. Um, and they set up this great scheme called the Kolo Nafaso project, where they actually support and empower these women in Burkina Faso uh, by offering pre-financing and training. And I just find it fascinating that Googling the Kolo Nafaso project and knowing myself that it exists, I could hardly find anyone talking about it, even though I know there are lots of brands that, that use this grade. And I just, I love the fact that there are companies putting more in behind the scenes than maybe is talked about. Um, so the the training they give to women basically helps them turn the shea fruit that they harvest into this really high quality material that AAK can then buy from them. So because they're buying a processed material, it's then they can pay the women a higher fee rather than just buying the raw fruit. Um, and because shea has to be wild harvested, you can't just farm it throughout the year. Um, these women can only harvest at sort of particular seasons through the year. So normally a middleman will just pay them, you know, as at the point they're buying the bags off them. So it's really difficult to have financial stability, financial independence. Um, so AAK will actually pre-finance that to give them basically a steady salary through the year. And I just love the idea of empowering women and making um, making them more able to be financially independent and financially stable, it's all while providing a great great uh, great quality product that, very, that benefits our skin. It's interesting because uh, you're too young to probably remember Anita Roddick, but Anita Roddick was the first woman ever to speak to me about this sort of thing. So she would go back to, she had this idea of always having field to bottle and she would go back and try to empower the local women, especially if they were local women who were in a collective harvesting whatever she was about. And I, she's the one woman who in my entire 30 five years now as a beauty editor that I was just like I'm going to give it all up and come and work for you what you're trying to do is so ahead of the game she was talking about this in the late 80s early 90s so I love this when you say lipic shea am I saying l-i-p-i-c uh, sorry l-i-p-e-x so oh, lipid lipid. Expert, lipid. Oh, yeah. right um, and you would use that in hair care and body care yeah. body care and face care everything yeah, um, so what's really interesting about um, AAK is they actually have a whole range of shea-derived products. So even if shea, pure shea butter is a bit too heavy uh, for some people on, on the face, they've actually got some really lightweight liquid versions of it that are much more breathable and um, can suit a really, really wide variety of, um, of product formats. I do think it's one of those ingredients, actually, that has lots of positive press. I know people that have dry skin conditions that will always look for shea butter on an inky list. So it's sort mm -hmm. of a sort of by word for uh, a really good moisturising formulation. Right, next active ingredient. So this one is uh, one of the first I ever used when I joined the industry. And it's, it's kind of a staple that I keep going back to. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's only one legitimate supplier of it. So if you see it on the inky list, that is the real deal that you know you're getting. Uh, its trade name is Fucogel, um, but you'll see it on the inky list being sold as biosaccharide gum one. <laughs> Very catchy, I know. <laughs> um, and it's basically a polysaccharide, which is a long chain of sugar molecules. And depending on what what type of sugar molecules are used, how long the chain is, how branched the chain is, what the configuration is. You can get some really interesting different properties from polysaccharides. Um, we're kind of seeing a bit of an explosion in the industry of this technology at the moment because you can make it through fermentation, uh, which is very popular. But uh, Fucogel, I think, dates back at least 20, possibly 30 years. It's kind of been, been around for a long, long time. And what, does it, what role does it play in skincare? Sorry. Um, so if somebody tries to call you, you'll go, you'll shut off. I know my mum often tries to FaceTime me at this time of, <laughs> at this time of night. <laughs> Sorry, go on. What role does this polysaccharide have in skin? So it is a brilliant multifunctional active ingredient. Um, we call it a smart ingredient because it's soothing, moisturising, anti-aging, restructuring, and it improves the touch, so the sensorial properties. Um, 
it has brilliant data to show it reduces redness and soothes the skin within five minutes of application. So it's going to give you that instant relief. Um, it helps moisturize the skin both short term and long term, and it helps restructure the skin barrier. And it it basically is something you can drop in as almost a workhorse ingredient, a bit like glycerin in a way where it's it's not the most exciting thing to talk about. It's quite difficult to put on front of pack. You know, it doesn't sound like a wild hibiscus extract or something. But I know that if I put that in there, it's going to deliver results and really help. If skin. we can make hyaluronic acid sexy, we can make a polysaccharide sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, Why not? I'll leave that on to, to the marketers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I started an R&D lab, not a brand. <laughs> um, when an R&D person comes to you and wants something that you don't think is a good idea, not an R&D person, a marketer comes to you and says they want something that's not a good idea, do you sort of turn it down and say, I wouldn't do that if I were you? I think really it boils down to what, why is it that they want to use that? Is there actually, trendy. what's the underlying reason? Sorry? It's trendy. That's always why the marketeers want to do it. I'm I mean, there, there is that. Normally an ingredient is trending because of good reason. Um, there is also, yeah, there, there are times where you just add things in at what we call marketing levels. So you just put it in and um, a brand can make a claim about that. But what we would always do at NCOS is make sure that the whole formulation really delivers what it's saying on the tin, even if it's not specifically due to the, the reason they're, they're saying it is. Yeah. It's very interesting. I've done a lot of brand consultancy and I remember doing some brand consultancy for a hair brand that will remain nameless. And they said to me, what do you think of these active ingredients? And they were all super trendy. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, I think at the time, I'll tell you how long ago it was kale. Do you remember when kale was super trendy? It was like kale, charcoal, whatever it was. And we were, talking about really shampoo, we were talking about a shampoo brand. And I said, yeah, I, I get they're really fashionable, but what are they going to do for your hair? <laughs> I think what's What's really fascinating, though, is when something like that happens, ingredient suppliers will normally then dig into how to make that functional ingredient. So taking the example of kale, there is a really awesome kale protein ingredient that's really good for strengthening the hair now. It's got really good efficacy data on it. Um, can't say that all brands back in the day were definitely using that, but I just find it interesting that it kind of goes in circles. This was a good 15 years ago. I met the formulating <laughs> chemist the other day and, I, and she said, do you remember doing that brand consultant? So I was like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember. Uh, yeah, it, at the time it was all about detoxing. Like, very strange, you know me. I've seen, I'm sure like you've been there, seen it done, it's seen it all. Somebody asked about CBD. That's a really good one. Thoughts on CBD? Oh, um, mixed thoughts on it. I think um, I really interesting, really, really interesting scientific research being done into it. Um, it's known that we do have these cannabinoid receptors in our bodies. Um, so there are the pathways existing. Um, back when CBD first started becoming a big trend in, in um, skincare, we were asked about, about it a lot. And there really wasn't the data to support all the claims that, that were being said at the time. But I think since then, you know, quite a lot of research has gone into it. Um, it can be very difficult regulatory wise as well obviously with the the derivation of it um ensuring that the thc content is low enough um the uk is actually stricter than a lot of the eu and we say that you can't actually harvest the cbd from the flowering tops of the plant so it makes it a lot harder to um to actually get it unless you're synth synthesizing it in the lab um i tend to prefer if, if people ask me for the cbd for sort of regulatory and efficacy reasons i tend to suggest some alternative ingredients like adaptogens that have similar claimed benefits but more data to back them up that i can sort of share with a client yeah I'm, i totally agree uh next active ingredient that you love and then i'm going to ask you about pre and probiotics but that's just for me because i'm fascinated sure uh, oh, let me check my notes. Lost my lost my trail of thought. Sorry, that's my thought. Throwing you a <laughs> CBD curveball, Lorna. That's why. Ah, oh, yes. The next one I wanted to chat about is another unsung hero of so many formulations. Uh, rather than an active ingredient, it is emulsifiers. Yes. So, um, again, 
They're not very sexy to talk about, but they are literally what holds together most creams, lotions, potions. <laughs> um, and Explain what they do um, to people that don't know. Yeah. So if um, if you think of mixing oil and water together, um, you know, if you've got an olive oil and balsamic vinegar dressing that you want to mix together, you'll know that you shake them together and then they just separate back into their two phases over time. Uh, most creams are made out of oil and water, so they would have a natural tendency to split back apart. And what emulsifiers do is they're little molecules that basically wedge themselves between the oil and the water and make it more possible to, to hold them together. And that's really how um, you can stabilise creams where they're little oil droplets in water. Um, Dare I ask, and you have a favourite emulsifier? <laughs> We, we don't have a favourite, but we do use different ones depending on what texture, what um, skin feel and things we want. And there's one I want to highlight called Emollium mellifera, which is um, it's a mix of naturally derived components. So it's partially from beeswax, partially from jojoba oil, uh, partially from palm, so responsibly sourced palm. And um, it's really interesting because so I've got got similar to, to the ingredient here it's like waxy mm -hmm. pellets which we melt at sort of 70 80 degrees into the oil phase of your emulsion then you blitz it together with your water at 5,000 rotations per minute and that forms the cream um but depending on what emulsifier you use you can get like a really lightweight fluid silky textured lotion all the way through to like a really rich body butter and what's really interesting about emollient mellifera is they call it the the supply calls it the the first auto climate adapting uh, emulsifier and they've they've done some user trials to show that in cold and dry conditions it creates a soft comfortable film that makes you sort of feel comforted but then in hot and humid conditions you'd then be worried like oh is it going to be really greasy and heavy and actually it leaves the skin feeling really less less heavy less greasy because it creates a really lightweight film um so yeah yeah and it's, it's kind of you know again you're never going to talk about this on the front of pack but it's fascinating that we can use all these different tools to build up something that really but works it's also got a very sexy name emollium melliflora somehow sounds like it's been picked by virgins <laughs> up a mountain at sunlight <laughs> <laughs> you know the That's marketing clay <laughs> And um, yeah, it's got a pretty unique and sort of um, long inky name. I'm, I'm pretty sure the Inky List Caffeine Eye Cream actually uses this one. Um, not 100% sure, but um, yeah, I, I would hazard a guess that it does. I like yeah. that product. I think it's very nice. Yeah, one yeah, of really their interesting. Star products. I like what they're doing there. I mean, they've gone a, a little bit off piste recently, but I genuinely like that, that couple. I think they're really nice. Right, next yeah. one. Uh, next one sounds a bit odd when I first say it. it's algae oil and um, the inky name is triolean and it's basically an oil a lightweight oil that has traditionally been made synthetically so from petroleum derivatives and uh, more recently there has been a way to uh, the, this supplier has figured out a way to basically take responsibly grown sugarcane and then ferment it with algae, feed it sunlight, or like light, and that's all it needs. And then the algae produce this oil. It's Can so I just cool. say, the more I learn about bio-fermented active ingredients, the more my, it's, it's so impressive. It really is. It's so yeah, impressive. We're, we're all slightly algae obsessed uh, in, in the NCOS I'm team. I'm not surprised. Algae obsessed and also bio obsessed. Yeah. I just think it's incredibly clever um, that those things have been done. I was learning about the uh, hemisqualine that um, I want to say Amara, what Amaris make in these huge, yeah. huge, huge, like sort of 15 story bioferment uh, places, just incredible. So yeah. essentially they can take uh, a sugar cane to, and then this bacteria, and then they put it together with these active ingredients and they end up creating all these unique active ingredients rather than harvesting them from nature. Cause obviously in Brazil, they're in the rainforest, which is the last thing they need to do. So the whole thing is fascinating. I do think um, it's the future and also Korea, let's be honest here. They've been bio fermenting for years. <laughs> for literally thousands of literally years. Yeah. Thousands of years. <laughs> 
this is the um, this is the alga pure oil. So this is the algae oil. Um, I mean, it it looks and feels much like a lot of other oils, but um, it's really cool. And then the the supplier has actually also run some efficacy tests on it to show that it can help moisturize the skin, feel lightweight, and things. So another really nice ingredient to have in our formulators toolkit. Good. Okay, I love this. Right. Any others? Uh, last couple are more to do with hair care, actually. Um, love that. And, um, Although you do look to I me think... like you've got very low maintenance, undamaged, nice hair. I, I actually tried to uh, dye my hair purple a few months ago, and um, my hair decided that no amount of bleach was actually going to damage and bleach it. It was like, I am remaining, I am remaining brown. And, do you uh, follow <laughs> and Michelle Lab Muffin Beauty Science? I, I do. I'm, I'm a, a super fan, I would I'm say. A, I'm a super <laughs> fan. Shout out to her. She's amazing. An incredible science communicator. Come on, if she can get purple hair, that said, she knows she damages it so much, you can get purple hair. Come on. I, yeah. <laughs> I just need to try harder. <laughs> I put that percentage vol peroxide up a bit. That's the secret. It's no pain, no gain on that one. If I have shorter hair next time you see me, you know something went wrong. <laughs> Same with me as well. Uh, so your hair care ingredients? Uh, yeah, we're um, we're really seeing the the marriage of hair and skin at the moment on on scalp care. We're just seeing this massive boom for for looking after the scalp at the moment, um, and a big part of that is hair density. Um, so we we can't really talk about hair growth because that's more of a medical claim. Uh, that's kind of the realms of, of minoxidil, which is kind of the, the leading topical treatment on that. But we have some really interesting ingredients that can help uh, promote the growth phase of the hair growth cycle. It's called the anagen phase and just keep it in that growth phase for a little bit longer. And that really helps to improve the, the density of the hair. Um, so one of the better known ingredients for, for that um, is called Capixel. Um, it is a mixture of a red clover extract with acetyl tetrapeptide 3, so a, a peptide in an extract. And uh, they've got really interesting data basically showing how um, the ingredient helps to anchor the, the hair follicle and provide this really healthy environment for the, the hair to grow. Is this the same they use in lash and brow serums as well? Yes, yeah, they've got space for that as well. Because traditionally it was obviously a prostaglandin analogue by accident discovered via <clears throat> medicine. But I have seen some people, and I was very sceptical about this acetyl tetrapeptide for hair growth as well. Jo came around the other day and she'd been using it on her lashes and she's having to trim her lashes. They've put them in that growing <laughs> anagen phase so long. And she says with... Mm, absolutely no irritation you the irritation you get from the prostaglandin analogs gone so i'm that you see and also i'm trying to encourage my hair into that anagen phase i've always been skeptical you now have sold me on it a double first to cambridge <laughs> starting a company super young you're in a lab i'm in <laughs> it's uh, you need a test it is an interesting one because the the hair growth cycle typically takes between three and six months so you can't really see results unless you're really um good at you know being consistent with with using it over time um it's it's quite difficult actually when we're developing hair density products because the clinical studies have to go on for six months before you can actually figure out if it's working well or not as somebody that suffered from covid induced uh, hair loss uh, and hair thinning massively the amount of times i say to my followers you're just gonna have to wait it out i'm so sorry but you can't show the difference in two or month, two months or three months it's going to take six months yeah. and then suddenly you're going to think Wow, my hair is so much thicker. Uh, is it best applied in a scalp leave-on scalp serum? Yeah, best to have in leave-on so that it's there for, for longer. Okay. Um, there's quite a few products on the market that use this ingredient, but there's there's one I'm allowed to name called Hair Burst uh, Multi-Active Scalp Serum. And that's because it actually uses the Capixel trade name on, on pack. Um, is the company called Hair Burst? Yes. Oh, li li listen, I can tell shares are going to go through the roof now my followers are obsessed with anything that will encourage their hair to grow that's amazing right and what's the final hair active ingredient um more to do with styling actually so um there have been leaps and bounds in hair styling polymers um 
you know, traditionally you get that really heavy, tacky, crunchy film if, if you want to really hold the hair in place. And there's a huge amount of research delving into um, how to provide that really strong hold and possibly even better curl retention than some of the, the traditional polymers whilst remaining quite lightweight on the hair. Um, and there is an ingredient called sodium polyitoconate, which is a naturally derived polymer where if you imagine most hair styling polymers work by creating this film on the hair and sort of sticking layers of this film together. The sodium polyitoconate has a kind of spot welding technique where it says like let's or almost like a, a fishing net versus um a big plastic bag lump spaghetti or something. yeah like a plastic bag yeah exactly and so because you've got this more breathable film but it's still spot welded in place it's kind of tacking the hair in place whilst not feeling nearly as heavy um so re really yeah. interesting so it would the be something to uh you would put on after shampooing and conditioning to blow dry with yeah okay. yeah it could be that or even um onto dry hair just to um just to sort of have it as the finishing finishing touch to hold hold in place what is really fascinating though is uh, the psychology of hair styling products we we developed a really high humidity curl retention product um which felt really lightweight on the hair and it actually got bad feedback because people thought it wasn't crunchy enough because they're so used to that it's like no no really i've got the data to show you that it is working as well but um yeah it's interesting sometimes when the ingredient technology always comes along sooner than customers are ready for it ahead of the game yeah absolutely it's, it's really fascinating um it's a little bit one of the things i wanted to ask you about was the demonization of silicon in hair products as well because like lovely michelle labmuffin i'm obsessed with amo amo dimethicone if your hair is damaged like mine three cheers for the lightest yeah, in the world. yeah i'm absolutely. a big fan of um, yeah, I think well, if you ever succeed one... in dyeing your hair purple you're going to need it in your life <laughs> yeah that's true um yeah silicones are specifically used in high-end contact lenses because they're so breathable that's the example i always give i think people worry that. that it's going to create this this film that's never going to come off they are um really smart technology i think also that 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 fear mongering around silicones comes from the era of uh, which i you were probably a baby but you were certainly like a toddler or something which was wash and go. So the vidouse is in wash and go, which did used to build up and leave your scalp gritty and greasy. But I mean, that's like 30 years ago and it's still getting a bad rap, it's terrible. Do you have any favorite products? You said you were going to mention that people have been asking, I don't know if you've noticed, have you got any favorite products there? What do you, what do you love that you rely on? Or maybe I should ask, uh, what, what I should, should ask there, maybe what do you wish you'd formulated as well? <laughs> I, I, was, I was going to say the problem is that we're always developing the things that are coming out in two years time so i can't tell you what my favorite products are at the moment my my face is currently full of uh full of products that won't launch until at least next year i'm afraid what, what, um, what trends can you see coming out that you think are going to be big without giving too much away to your competitors yeah sure um to be honest i think bioferments are the are, are just going to be massive um I am loving the whole focus on skin barrier rather than strong acids at the moment that's kind of worked its way over from Korea. Um, I think our, our poor skin has been through a lot over, over here in the UK with sort of overly strong uh, vitamins, totally acids, retinols. Um, yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on board for the whole ceramide, skin barrier, um, boosting products, any, anything around that. Um, thoughts and, thoughts and probiotics in skincare. I feel like it's a bit of a um, DBD moment, right? Oh, um, I would say anyone who claims to know everything about it is lying. Uh, but there have been really interesting leaps forward in the research for it. So there are definitely prebiotics that are Again, there we go. Somebody trying to call you again, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, there are prebiotics that now have a really interesting clinical efficacy to be used in, in the skin. So, um, oh, what's the inky name of the one I'm thinking of? There's one that goes by the uh, trade name of Bioacolia, and it is... 
it's very interesting I'll... sorry while you're looking that up it's very interesting i went to la roche posay to the village of la roche posay where they treat people with uh eczema and psoriasis as well as uh from uh burns and uh post chemotherapy treatments and their research into uh bio um prebiotic and postbiotic ferments is fascinating really fascinating as an anti-inflammatory within the skin but again you yeah. say somebody once told me that the problem with trying to formulate a product is that each individual person has individual skin microbiome and somebody actually said to me that the skin microbiome can be different almost from nose to cheek to yeah. chin to chest to hand to scalp so that's the difficulty with formulating right yeah, absolutely it's um it's like a unique fingerprint to each person uh, although interestingly couples that live together tend to end up uh harmonizing their microbiome slightly uh but um, i heard yeah. that about gut microbiomes as yeah. well like you're supposed to take on your partner's gut microbiome as well which is fascinating yeah um, but yeah it does make it really difficult and i think uh traditionally the whole antibacterial approach uh doesn't really work because the microbiome is always going to grow back and so it's much better to be able to control more finely control which species are growing and in what ratio they are on the skin um compared to just killing it all off and then it will grow back in some random configuration that you can't control um i think a really good example of this is the acnes or what was traditionally known as p acnes it's seen as the the bad bacteria for acne uh, but actually it's really important to have some of it on your skin it's only when it overgrows and kills off other things on the skin that it becomes problematic so there are some really interesting prebiotic and postbiotic ingredients now dealing with rebalancing that rather than uh, trying to kill it off too harshly um, and the so that, yeah pre prebiotic is basically providing the food for the biotics probiotic is the the bacteria itself which is difficult to do in skincare because we use preservatives and then postbiotics are the byproducts made from the bacteria uh, so that interestingly actually often is all these fermented ingredients we like using um yeah huge huge area of interest uh watch this space i would say i think there's already some really interesting moves forward in the area but certainly plenty plenty more to come okay and then if you're going to go shopping right uh what do you think you can save money on and what do you think it's worth splurging money on? Oh, I, I mean, my, my base staples would be a good cleanser, a good moisturiser and a good SPF. Um, and, then and do you think they can else? all be available on the high street reasonably priced? Because I definitely think they can. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think it's, um, you know, there's so much in a formulation like glycerin, like these emulsifiers, where you can get to a certain level um, at an affordable price. Um, and then the rest is really to do with the experience and the extra benefits that you want. I guess it's like buying a car. I think I was, I was chatting to uh, Sam Farmer about this recently, and he, he gave this example of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've not met a single person who doesn't like Sam. But um, uh yeah, he was saying, you know, it's, it's like buying your, your first second-hand car uh, for quite a cheap price versus a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. Um, they both function as cars and they'll both, they'll both do the job, but it's about what experience you particularly want. Um, more expensive doesn't always mean better, but there is a certain level to which there are certain actives, like some of the, like Madagascar aside and, and Emblica, where they do carry a certain cost to them. Um, where it would be difficult to, to offer it at really, really cheap prices. But And then what would you splash your money on? Are there steps within your skincare where you think, right, I would spend a bit more money? Or actually, without naming brands or products, are there products that cost more money simply to develop? Um, anything with a high amount of oil means that you don't have any water in the formulation and water is the cheapest ingredient you can possibly use. Um, so, for example, cleansing balms and cleansing oils tend to be more expensive than their water-based counterparts. Um, serums, essences, ampules, all that kind of high active loading um, product tends to carry a much higher um, ingredient cost uh, purely because they're really the, the products that brands focus a lot of budget into 
using really high levels of those key active ingredients, maybe using two or three together to, to combine and get the best best performance. Um, but equally, we, we've we seen moisturizers with really high cost of goods as well. It, it really depends on the brand and, and how they want to approach it. And un unfortunately, it is quite difficult to tell just from, from looking. And it's very interesting as well, because uh, obviously there is, which isn't your special area, but then there is packaging as well. And packaging is fundamentally different. Some packaging, I remember the days when Creme de la Mer was first launched and it came in this huge box covered in cellophane with this beautiful ceramic pot and a little silver spoon and stuff like that. And, and then there's Curel or whatever, you know, whatever the equivalent might be on the pastry. Yeah, so it is it's fascinating, it really is. If you were to go shopping somewhere in the UK, would you be tempted by a super drug or a Primark or a Boots or would you really go and go to Nature Republic or something well, like that? I'm, I'm probably a terrible person to ask because I get so excited about all the ingredients that I want to go to, to like the Space NKs, the Korean pop-up stores, ones that, that can just no. talk to me about everything. No, the, the shout out to Space NK and also to Nature Republic. Can I just say, it was when I first discovered Nature Republic that I was like, and they've just opened in Westfield, and I, I was like, I don't even understand half the packaging. I just want it. <laughs> so sometimes, from your point of view, at least you could read it and understand everything. From my point of view, it was just, it reminded me of when I first started as a beauty editor. And you would go into Space and K, and Space and K was specifically for products. You it was before the internet. I am that old, Lorna. Specifically for products you couldn't buy anywhere else. And now I go into Nature Republic, and I still get that same buzz. I like, which is why hence I like to get a nice company out there to sponsor to take us to South Korea. Right? <laughs> it's, I uh, I went out. Uh, so I'm actually going back out to Korea next month. But I went out in December with my husband and basically just parked him in a cafe for most of the day, and then just went right. I'm off. I'm off cosmetic shopping now. So uh, yeah, it's, it's like a playground out there. It's, it's great. Yeah, fun. just absolutely heavenly. Also, can I just say thank heavens to them for the culture of, of oh, not overly stripping the skin, being careful with the skin, improving the skin barrier, all about hydration, humectants, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, thank heavens. We needed them at this time. That whole culture of re respecting your skin is fundamentally different to what came came out of the states six or seven years ago. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. Seriously, I told you she would be amazing. Um, now I am going to type this up underneath, and with my uh, well, I have got a BSc, but uh, it's not necessarily a relevant BSc. Uh, would you go in and spell check anything in case I fuck up massively? <laughs> I will, I will lurk in the like comments. Mark, and, like, and... like reading my homework and marking my homework. <laughs> no, go in and go, come on, Nadine, you can do better than this. Actually, I, I haven't said this to you yet, but uh, you have a small part to play in, in NCOS actually existing in the first place. Because when I was working my full-time job uh, back at my last place, I would then go home and between the hours of about 7pm and 1am, 2am, would basically be planning out my business plan for NCOS. And I was living alone at the time and I used to put on like your videos, um, all, all the base, basically beauty and lifestyle vloggers and, and vloggers of the time. So Celeste Lalonde, yourself, uh, Zoella, all, all those. I just watched them all the time while planning out NCOS. So, you know, may, maybe NCOS would never exist had, uh, had you not been posting your videos on YouTube. I'd like to think <laughs> that, but I'm sure that's not the case. But can I also say that I wouldn't have a career conversely doing what I do now because I've been a beauty journalist for 35 years but it's only in the last sort of six or seven years that I've been doing this and that is directly related to the explosion in the science of skincare becoming public knowledge to a degree and then me in a way having to become this sort of liaison between science communicators like yourself and consumers because there was nobody really doing that as well so again it works both ways so thank you to you and every other science communicator shout out sam farmer uh oh my god do you follow jen eco well oh yeah i'm probably following everyone people yeah. michelle lab muffin <laughs> seriously everything i've ever learned i've learned from people like you so thank you heads off to you like i say when i'm in this situation even with my my humble BSc. I want to be the most stupid person in the room. I want to look up to people like you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank and I you. hope your first live wasn't too painful. No, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And 
if you've got any questions for Lorna, if you just tag her, um, I will tag both NCOS, her company, and at Lorna Radford. She might well come in, but she will certainly be sense checking and fact checking the caption below, trust me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.